Hi, welcome to another installation of Craft Chat. My name is Titi Nguenya, Director of Communications at Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. And this week we're very excited to have a special guest, designer, weaver, and fiber maven, Gwendolyn Gavin. Before we get started, if you would please um, be sure to mute your screen. And if you have any questions for our guest, feel free to put your question in the chat box. Um, there's a button at the bottom of your screen and there's a chat box to the side of your screen. Uh, you can place your questions there and when we get to our Q&A segment, we will answer as many of those questions as possible. If you haven't heard, Fuller Craft Museum is open to the public. Our hours are Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to 5. And this weekend, we are opening our newest um, exhibition entitled From Where I Sit, Permanent Collection Seating. It's a, an amazing um, exhibition for all kinds of funky and interesting looking seats, chairs. So please stop by the museum this weekend for the opening of that exhibition. If you enjoy this craft chat, if you enjoy our programming, please be sure to make a donation in any amount um, to Fuller Craft Museum. I'm putting a link in our chat box right now and you can make a donation through that link. All right, so we're gonna get started and I'd like to introduce now our um, Director of Education, Sage Russo. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome back to another craft chat from Fuller Craft Museum. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today with our guest Gwen Gavin uh, to discuss all things fiber and textiles and embroidery. Um, Gwen is a um, really talented textile artist and a great friend of us at the museum. Um, she's coming to us today um, to also preview what to expect in her upcoming embroidery class here at the museum. Um, as TT mentioned, we are fully open to the public again, which is a very exciting opportunity after so many months of being um, closed. Um, so including our workshops, our studio workshops are all happening in person. Um, we've had, I think, uh, three already successful in-person workshops since um, we fully opened in September. So it's a really exciting time to come in and get back in touch with craft. So I'm really happy to introduce Gwen today. Hi Gwen, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm great. How does it feel to be able to be back uh, teaching in person after so many months of isolation? Um, I think it's an adjustment for sure. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of responsibility, I think, to come into it, but I think, um, I don't know if everybody else has, but I've kind of missed some of the social aspect of things. So it'll be kind of nice to see, um, to be back with people and around and socializing and chatting with people. Um, and I think, um, with embroidery, I know that there's a lot of online stuff but I think um, the tactility of embroidery and when I've had the in-person classes, like I don't, I often wonder how to kind of tackle some of the things that come up um, on a remote call. So I think it'll be really good to be back in person. I, I think I can, um, it, it'll be, it'll be really exciting to be in the studios and, and again, to be around people again. It's so nice to be in the museum again, for sure. Yeah, we're really, we're all really looking forward to it, that's for sure. Um, so tell us about yourself as a fiber maven and um, everything that, that your textile world is about. Yeah, so I think um, I have a little bit of a presentation about some of my stuff is, um, that we can go back into. So um, to start, I craft and textile crafts in particular have been a part of my life since almost since I can remember but I remember doing like cross stitch at a really young age. Uh, I'm primarily I primarily identify myself as a weaver but um, because of this background and that long history I've done um, I do a lot of different textiles. Um, this is a that is a detail of a scarf that I wove a few years ago um, that 
I don't know that it surprised me, but it was um, a um, somewhat serendipitous result. And it's, it's, it was um, felted and it came out ruffled and I used it as a swap gift. Um, you, you briefly just mentioned that you started, um, you know, some of the needle crafts as a younger child, but tell us a little bit about how you kind of first fell in love with textiles and how, you know, that's kind of been your, your love. Yeah, so I think um, I kind of, I, I, the moment that sort of like resonated most with me, I, I was, was a sewing project. I did, um, I was about nine or 10 years old. Um, and it was a, it was a really simple tunic top um, with drawstring shoulder straps that I did with my mother. And I, I feel like that was kind of the moment that I kind of knew I'd found my thing. Um, mm. I'd done, like I said, I've done craft and textile stuff for a very long time. And um, it's another one of those sort of anecdotal stories. Uh, an aunt I had never met sent me a fashion design Barbie doll um, <laughs> that when I was like six or seven and I still to this day like am flabbergasted that she's like did she know that that was something I would need um, but um, so yeah if um, if you can go back one more slide TT that would be yeah so so as you can see there um, so I studied fashion, that got me into fashion, and um, I worked about 20 plus years off and on um, in sewn product manufacturing. I worked as a technical designer, which basically means pattern making, um, but I did some other stuff for the production cutting and sewing process. Um, my responsibility was to make sure that whatever went out onto the sewing floor when they cut it was as accurate as possible. So. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of pressure there sometimes, but um, also a lot of fun. And then I managed the production um, aspect of things. I controlled, you know, ran the raw materials and managed a lot of that. So all of that kind of, you know, goes back to my my fashion background. And a lot of that still kind of informs a lot of what I what I do. Um, but I do. I picked up spinning a few years ago. I knit. I do embroidery and stitching. Um, I've done some felting, some dyeing, and I dabble in jewelry making. When I have an event to go to and I can't find what to wear, I'll make, <laughs> make my own. And um, as you'll see later on, I do sometimes play around with mixed media, sort of visual arts. Um, and most recently tried to like beef up my illustration and watercolor. Um, I did formally study fashion and textiles. Um, so, and then this is the scarf, this image here is the scarf that I was talking about earlier. It's a um, felted, ruffled, so it's silk. The ruffled part is um, a raw silk, and then the felted part is an alpaca wool blend. Um, so um, I think the first few things I have to show are some weaving samples that I've done, um, some pieces that I'm particularly proud of. Um, I think these two, it's all hand spun yarn. And then I used a lot of my stitch work, a lot of the, not necessarily embroidery stitching, but the most of those um, added pieces, the shells and rocks that you see and sea glass are stitched on. Um, it was much um, a more effective way to get that image um, on those pieces and to get them secure. Um, so those, that kind of comes into it, but I hand, the hand spun all those yarns to kind of get the effect that I wanted. There's some curly locks and everything. Um, I don't do so much of this kind of weaving. I'm playing around with it as much as possible. I prefer to be on a loom. And I think um, the next image is um, my woven lamp shade. So I did these quite, um, quite a while back. Um, it was actually my degree project. And um, they were inspired by menswear fabrics. So the area where I was studying was known for its worsted, um, worsted uh, mills. And um, I was kind of inspired by that. I was inspired by lights. I was inspired by a lot of things when I created this. And there was, there's, a, um, like I said, the menswear fabric really inspired it. And the gray, I don't know if you can see it so much, but the gray, lampshade there has a placket to sort of nod back to that sort of suit thing, um, that suiting feature. The, um, and this is kind of where a lot of that sewing and that background and stitching and stuff really kind of informs my textiles. I had to have a, a really strong knowledge of um, 
of sewing to really get those done well. Um, I also, um, I forget which one's next. Let's see, I also do some felting and this is another class I occasionally teach at the museum. Um, this is another one, it's fun for gifts. Um, I love to do these felted bead necklaces. They're just, I think they're a unique and colorful um, accessory. And then um, several years ago, a relative commissioned me to make two for her granddaughters. Um, and those are the two that you see on the right of the screen. Um, I do, and that kind of brings in my jewelry making that I dabble in, I do the knotting. Um, again, I think having the comfort with the needle, which goes back to my earlier days in cross stitching and everything, um, really informs a lot of that. And um, I do like to bring that into that class as well. Um, I also do have done some needle felting. I think the next one is a mobile I did. Um, it's not, a, getting a good picture of that is hard because there's so much in it, but um, that was a mobile I did for my, well, it was for my sister before my niece was born, but it's in my niece's nursery. Um, and then I needle felted the elephant as well. Um, what I love about needle felting and sculpting with needle felting is it kind of, um, if you gave me a lump of clay and asked me to make those animals, it would not come out looking <laughs> like one of those animals. But if you give me a clump of wool and somehow I seem to know how to sculpt it into something like that. And I think that's what's beautiful about craft um, is sometimes it's just finding that medium that speaks to you. And for me, it's yarn, yarn and fiber just tends to speak to me. So um, I tend to do needle felting primarily as like gifts and fun things. I don't really um, just, it's, it's a fun way to create something like that, but I don't, I don't do too much more. Um, and then I've done some dyeing. This is always fun, but you need a lot. You need a, a decent space and a clean space to do it appropriately, but I did do a couple of their shibori. Um, the green tie is supposed to be green, blue, and teal. Um, that was wrapped around a pole and then painted and then um, I let it cure and that's how you got that um, resist dye. And then the gray tie was a, I forget the name of the shibori technique, but it's where you stitch and pleat and then paint the dye on top. Um, and then the scarf is another one. I think that was wrapped and I think it was more like a tie dye um, type tech technique where I just twisted it and then painted the dye on. Um, so I kind of have a broad knowledge of textiles um, and embroidery. This is an embroidery sampler I did for the class that I teach. Um, and embroidery, I think, is kind of important. I think um, it's one of my earliest skills, as I mentioned. I remember doing cross-stitching um, as a child. Um, but I think what I love about it the most is you can, it's, it's relatively affordable. The hoop itself runs between $1 and $3, depending on where you're shopping for them. The yarn spools themselves, and you get a good amount, more than enough usually for a decent project, are affordable. Um, they're like, they run about 50, 60 cents and the needles and are right there. Um, and also, you know, they run about a couple of dollars for a packet. So it's, and you can get them at like Walmart, you can get them at all of the craft stores. I think even Target now has some embroidery stuff. So it's almost everywhere. So it's easy, easy to access, um, to access and, um, pick up. And I think there's a lot of kits out there that make it an easy skill to learn. Um, one of my the, um, favorite things about it is it's a really great way to mend and make do. Um, we live kind of live in a society that overconsumes, and I think I talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but sometimes you have a favorite skirt, a favorite outfit or a favorite piece or something that you want to just save or salvage, a sweater that has a hole in it. And um, embroidery is a good way to sort of save it. And I have a couple of examples of that. Um, it builds fine motor skills. And I think a lot of times we focus on that in children, but I think it's important to kind of maintain those skills as we get older. And I think there's more and more studies coming out to talk about that, especially with the elderly. Um, it's very portable and it's therapeutic. Um, I'm reading a book now that 
kind of um, about stitching and she gets talks about the history of um, the um, I think it's um, Mary Queen of Scots and how she did a lot of stitching while she was in ex while she was being held captive um, and it was a means of her um, her letters were being censored so her embroidery was a means for her to express herself um, but the per there's also some theories behind it that she suffered from some mental illness and that the stitching was probably very therapeutic there. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, so I think those are some things, um, if we can go back one slide, this is an example of, I have a skirt um, I had made for a wedding. Um, and later when I talk a little bit more about sort of my textile literacy thing, one of the important things that you kind of have to learn um, is to understand fabric and different things. I picked up this fabric to make the skirt um, for a wedding and it must have been on the bolt for a while. And that middle section, I don't know if you, you can't really see it, um, but it wasn't until the skirt was made and put on that you look down, you could see the faint line of the, the fold on the fabric. And unfortunately that's what happens with this kind of um, fabric. You really have to pay attention when you buy something that from you know big bulk fabric stores um, and know how long it's been there. But I didn't want to find a new skirt. I didn't, you know, I had put the work into creating this one or having this one created. And um, so to fix it, and it was just an easy fix. And in the end, I felt like it was a great addition to the skirt. I added um, the monotone embroidery um, to just salvage it. And it really did disguise it, but it kept the skirt exactly kind of what I wanted. So that was one of the mend and make do. And then I think the next picture is just like a, um, you know, it's an, an inexpensive tank top that I love to wear in the summertime. And um, I got a hole in the neckline and I didn't, you know, I knew the hole was gonna get worse and I just thought, well, I'll just throw some stitches on it. It's kind of messy stitching if you look at it, but it's not, you know, anything formal I'm gonna wear. And it adds a bit of personalization. So here I've mended and saved a shirt um, that I love. I love the color. I love how it feels. I like to just, you know, it's nice to have um, on a very hot day. Um, and it's got this little, I may go in and add a little few more stitches just to um, make it a little more consistent. But that's, you know, it's so easy to do. I think I spent a half an hour adding those stitches. So, um, so that's one of, those are kind of some of the things I really talk about in the embroidery class. They're also a great way, these are some um, quarantine projects I did. Obviously I wasn't out shopping very much, so I came up with this creative option for um, birthday cards and I actually got the idea from a former student. Um, she took one of my embroidery classes, but she's also a um, high school art teacher. And she took some of what I taught her to her students and had them painting pictures on the Aida cloth that you see here and um, adding embroidery to those pictures. And um, some of the work she showed me was phenomenal. Um, and so I was like, well, what can I do? And um, so I had, um, so I kind of just, um, you know, painted on the Aida, Aida cloth and added the stitches. The penguin is out, the penguin and the balloons are outlined. Um, and then there's French knots on the flower, if you can't tell. Um, and then I did about two, I think it was three years ago, um, I kind of had a rough, I don't want to say rough, I had a lot going on that year. Um, and I decided for myself that I would do a um, sketch a day, um, a sketch, uh, art a day sketchbook. And so the next, I think the next pictures have the, um, I decided to just, it was multimedia. I do a lot of tissue and ink and, and playing around with the textures. And um, I decided to see what would happen. I started adding, um, I used some yarn I had, some, some fiber and just added knots and stuff. There's some beading on the um, image to the right. So it, it's kind of a way to add dimension to other work. So there's so many, you know, the, the point of that is that with embroidery, there's so many possibilities. Um, and so I think um, these are some works in progress I have. I'm doing the sampler um, on the left is 
been something that's been ongoing for a while. Uh, and then the one on the right, I picked up some indigo dyed yarn from, I forget the name, and um, had just decided I wanted to do some various knots. I think for the most part, I'm doing the bouillon stitches, um, but there are some French knots in there. Just, I felt like that just helped the color come out and kind of kept it as a simple image. And I'm going um, the dyed, the dyed thread was um, ombre colored. So it's, I decided I wanted to go from light to dark and just kind of edge out. So that's kind of what that one is. And that project, I actually keep in a small project bag um, with a couple of other things. I think that's the next image. Um, and that, that little bag there, if you can see, I carry a little pair of embroidery scissors and everything. It fits in my purse, it fits in my backpack, it fits, you know, when I was going traveling to school, sometimes that was in there and if I had to sit and wait, because I'd often go a little early. Um, you know, if it's a nice thing to have and something to make you feel like you're doing, getting something done without staring at a screen all the time. You know, it's nice to have, to feel like you're accomplishing something. So um, again, it's it's portable and it's also, you know, sometimes when you're waiting or doing something there's an element of anxiety that can come into that and i think ha keeping having an activity like embroidery or even knitting is another good one i think for nervous um uh nervous activity um it's it's just calming it, it creates that calming thing so those are one of the things i love about embroidery so for this class, um, I think it's a four hour class. Um, I give you the option to use this template that I create. Um, I do bring a, a couple of um, colors of floss for you to use, but I encourage you to bring colors you like. I prefer contrasting um, just because we'll be working on, we would be working on, um, you know, the linen and the cotton you see there. Um, so you want you want to be able to see the stitches as you as you create them. Um, if you want to do them freehand, learn them freehand. I have squares for you to use instead. Um, I I usually try to keep some uh, linen around because I just love stitching on linen. I'm kind of obsessed with linen right now anyway. Um, but I also have some cotton muslin that's um, available um, that you can use, and the templates are on cotton muslin. The museum has embroidery hoops for people to use and I provide needles. Um, and, you know, it's, it'll be fun. I think it'll be a fun class. Um, one of the reasons I love to teach the classes that I teach um, is this, I have this passion for textile literacy, um, clothing. Textiles are everywhere and clothing in particular, which is usually textile based, almost always textile based, um, is one of our three basic needs. You know, the three basic needs are food, clothing, flu food, shelter, and clothing. Um, and when you think of textiles, they're really, clothing is pretty much all textiles and home, like, they make up a huge part of our home. Um, so they're everywhere. Um, and as such, I think we over consume them and underappreciate them and add to that, the fact that with the in industrialization and globalization, people are less and less aware of the processes and techniques that go into textiles. Um, and there's a huge chasm between that unawareness and our growing awareness of problems in production and globalization. Um, you know, I think there was a documentary a few years ago about um, that, that horrible um, sweatshop situation, I think, in Southeast Asia. Um, and that, that stuff is continuing to happen, but we're, because of our awareness and due to globalization, we are able to know about these things. Um, but I think it's important to know what's required. You know, it's one thing to know that, that there are people not being paid enough or not being treated appropriately, but when you don't have the appreciation for what their skills are and what they are creating, it's very difficult to make in, informed choices. Um, and I think um, 
I do, I do believe that there is a possibility of craft and handmade and in industry coexisting, but in what, in what manner and how to do that requires um, a greater knowledge of what we're consuming. Um, yeah. So I think that's the presentation and about me. So um, there's a lot of threads, not to, no pun intended, that kind of are throughout your, your work and your philosophy. And, and I'm curious about how um, that's translated in the classes. Um, I have, so I want you to talk to that a little bit, but before we do that, I have one, one question um, from the audience about the term curly locks that you use when you were describing the um, yep. woven seascapes. So this is kind of one of the, um, and again, I was not as aware of it until I started getting into spinning and more textile production. Um, or I think I may have been a little more aware of it when I studied textiles, but um, you hear the term wool and you kind of know what that is. But in reality, wool can be a huge number of things. And generally speaking, wool comes from sheep. Um, and sheep are like humans. Almost all of them have a different kind of hair. Um, curly locks come from sheep that have a defined curl or crimp and um, a lot of times they're blended and they just create an extra volume. Um, when I use them in that kind of weaving, I like to use them for the extra dimension, that extra sort of sense of um, fullness. Like um, I, I was going for a mossy look um, mm -hmm. I think when I where I added them so that's kind of that's what curly locks are they come from often I think it's Wens, uh, Wensleydale locks are some of the best they're the super soft hmm. also we also get cheese from those same sheep so yeah. um, that's what curly locks are um, so going yeah going back to your first question um, maybe you could clarify a little more yeah, I actually forgot what I asked you, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was trying to pull pull together the threads of, um, you know, you have you have all of these different types of um, experience with all different types of textiles and all different types of, um, you know, weaving, embroidering, dyeing. I know that you know a lot about everything, uh, or you know, about in textiles, and um, I and I have some experience with the needle crafts as well. So that was a very, um, I personally feel like, and I think you, know, you and I agree that it's sort of a, a very introductory way to get involved in textiles is like the needle crafts, like embroidery, the handwork, because um, it's so intro level. It's very, um, like you said, accessible, in, inexpensive. Um, but yet I feel like people do have a little bit of a hesitation um, to, to try needle craft and, and kind of tell us a little bit about um, the kinds of hesitations maybe you've seen from students and sort of what, um, you know, the kind of transformations they have when, when they've taken your classes. I think, a, I think a huge part of it too, um, and this kind of goes into when you start looking into the history of stuff, a lot of needle crafts are very much women's work. Um, so I think in trying to um, expand what women were um, do and are what how we're educated, I think um, a lot of times needle crafts have been marginalized as sort of like cutesy fun women stuff and as opposed to being valued for the fact that um, it was it was one of the things women were allowed to excel at and um, and do and I think for that reason um, it's definitely been um, um, mar like I said, marginalized. Um, and I think, again, not as many people did it. Before TV, people sat around, create kids were taught to make samplers. I mean, that was something that they did um, as part of their training, girls primarily. Um, and it was a very useful skill. It was something that they could actually earn money doing um, in days when women couldn't earn a whole lot. Um, so I think part of the trepidation is that it's the, got that sort of element of cutesy old school women's type work um, 
added to it. But I also think um, because it's been removed from our constant, um, from the home and people aren't doing it as much, they don't, it, it's not some, a skill that is, um, they're doing like the, the stitching and stuff like that. I've, I've been finding that there's, you know, it's not as smooth as a lot of people, a smooth learning, um, skill that, um, it's harder than it looks. Yeah. It's harder than it looks type thing. You know, the needle goes up and the needle goes down again, I think is the concept. But, um, I think a lot of times, um, Again, it's that, that, that fine motor skills that a lot of people aren't doing anymore. Um, and I think that's kind of a little daunting. I think, um, I think in, to a certain extent, there's this sense of putting pen on paper makes a lot more sense than drawing with thread. Mm -hmm. um, and yet watching those threads create an image is so much more satisfactory to me um, then, you know, sketching with, you know, for, to me, putting pen on paper is just for me to, to remember a shape and an image. It's not, it doesn't have that sense of satisfaction. I mean, that's all personal stuff and that's all, a, you know, a huge part of it. Um, I think it's a huge generational thing as well. Um, I have to say though, that with, there's been, you know, an uprise, an uprising, um, an increase in interest in needle arts, um, especially with a lot of the sort of um, political, there's some people doing some political and social justice sort of aspects of it and have really brought that in. And what's interesting about that is that really does tie back to the history of um, embroidery. Like I said um, in the book I'm reading, um, Mary Queen of Scots couldn't, her letters were being censured, censored so she could speak um, and say what she needed to through her embroidery mm -hmm. a lot easier. And I think that there's a long history of that in needle arts and textiles of, um, I can't say what I want or do what, I mean, there's a great podcast about um, women during the occupation during World War II who used needle crafts to really express their political opinions about what was going on when they weren't allowed to speak. Um, not just women, I think, it was across the board, but I think the women were the ones that in the design houses and stuff that um, that were doing it all. And they were, you know, I think there's stories of them embroidering belts with the their national anthem on them and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. um, I think it's becoming much more aware, and I think people are starting to see it as an amazing means of of expressing themselves in a very meaningful way. I think the fact that you've put work, like it's one thing, again, to put pen on paper and say, this is what I think on a poster. And then to put the hours of work into embroidering that same thing really sort of nails home how important that is to you. Yeah. Um, I, so it's kind of nice to see that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, some of the appeal of the embroidery is that it does take some time and it does take some patience, but it's really rewarding once you finish. And I think once you learn that, you know, as a beginner, it can be frustrating to, to learn some of the techniques. I mean, they're not very complicated. It, it can, mm -hmm. some of the more advanced stuff is harder than it looks, but like it is very satisfying in that way. Um, we have a question about um, your woven work and if you incorporate uh, needlework into your, your hand woven work. Um, to a certain extent, yeah. So, um, like I said, on those two pieces, the water's edge pieces, um, I, I used a linen thread to secure those down. And even though it wasn't an embroidery stitching, I think having that knowledge of, of the stitch work to really, and, and that is, that is something, um, some embroiderers use that is a technique, um, couching. And, um, there's another term that I've lost. Um, that a lot of stitchers will use. And I think I kind of modified that for those pieces. Um, I like I, the back, I use a lot of stitching and stuff to, um, for any of those pieces that will be hung or displayed in that sense. I have um, a border on the back that's stitched down. I think, I think too, um, a huge part of knowing the materials, so knowing um, when you get into embroidery, if, if it's um, the rabbit hole you decide to, to go down, um, you discover that there's, there's way more than just the embroidery floss 
and the cotton or Aida cloth that you have. There's, um, there was candle wicking, which was a huge thing in the um, colonial times um, where they used candle wicking yarn and it was primarily, uh, I think it was primarily French knots. Um, I think you start gaining a better knowledge of the materials and what's out there and what to use it for and mm -hmm. how it would best, how it will best look. And I think those little stitches that you do with the little cotton thread give you that greater knowledge and kind of add to that. And that does come into my work um, a little bit. Um, I haven't really added any embroidery to many of my woven pieces. And at the moment I'm doing more, um, not really doing a lot of the sort of art uh, weaving. I'm doing more product type stuff. So throws and towels and things like that. Um, I do have a scarf that I'll felt. Um, but, but those, I think every now and then I do find, and sometimes I find that it's easier to add um, some of the embroidery stitches. Um, when I'm doing certain weaving stitches, they relate to embroidery. So even though I'm not using embroidery, there's like sumac has a similar, um, a similar movement to the, um, is it the, I think it's the back stitch um, and or the running stitch, but there's, there's some, so there, the movements and the methods often mm. interact or um, cross over and translate. So we've got a question about um, your work in that um, do you work primarily in a series of similar works or do you tend to work on single projects, you know, single projects um, for your, your personal work? Um, you know, that's kind of a hard one to know. I think, um, so when I did those two water's edge pieces, I, like I said, I had spun the yarn. Um, so I had enough, I think I have enough to do one more. Um, and I'd hope to kind of do that, but I, I feel like I kind of, I don't want to say I pushed it, um, but I don't feel like I need to revisit that. Um, and that's kind of, I think what happens when I do the sort of art based projects, I get to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm done. I figured that one out. Whereas on the loom, um, and I saw several people ask about my loom. So over here, you can see my Ashford loom and I have a Macomb, I think they pronounce it Macomber. Um, downstairs that um, is bigger. Um, they're multi-harness looms and for me the structures and looking at the different structures I can create are what um, I really enjoy. Um, so I think a lot of times it's what I can do with the structures and um, again a product. So I am working on a towel project, towel base cloth type project that's more an R&D type um, thing. And I really played around. I have a small, um, I call it a peacock loom. I'm not sure if it was made by the people who make the peacock looms, but it looks exactly like them. It's a two harness and I added some extra um, bits to modify that plain weave. And um, I think just examining what I can do with the yarns and those structures to really create a a, a piece of fabric that I want it to do what I want it to do, if that makes sense. Um, and that's kind of where I get most energized and most inspired is like creating a piece of like saying, this is what this piece of fabric needs to do um, and how I can manipulate the materials and the equipment to make that fabric do what I want it to do. Yeah, I was gonna ask you. Does that you answer that question? <laughs> That's a, I think that's a long version of the answer um, <laughs> about what kind of looms you use. Um, I was going to ask you, do you feel like you're more um, process driven or more material driven? Because um, it seems like you're super oh, passionate about, yeah, it seems like you're really super passionate about certain types of fibers and things like that. Yeah, I think, um, I think in terms of the materials, um, I love yarn. I love, <laughs> it's kind of, I hoard it. Um, it's, I'm the type of person that goes to yarn swaps and doesn't leave any, I take. Um, I don't, I try not to go to yarn swaps for that reason. Um, but I, I also am trying to be a little more conscientious about what, 
what I'm working with and what I have. And at the moment, I'm going through all my yarns to figure out what I can use in what way. Um, I definitely think yarn can be very inspiring. I mean, I've, there's been times I've held yarn and it's inspired me. I just don't know what it's inspired me that it wants to be. Um, and then there's other times that I kind of know what I want to create. Again, the towels. I know what, what I want to go into them. Um, linen versus cotton, how much, um, what type of yarn. Um, and I think that there's um, a lot of research needs to go into that. And I do enjoy that to a certain level, to a certain extent. But I do think that sometimes there's a frustration in not finding what I want, which is it, one of the reasons why I learned sp spinning. Um, sometimes I couldn't find, and to be honest, I think almost everything I've learned at some point in time was me being like, well, I can't find what I want, so I guess I'll make it. Um, so I can't find the yarn I want, I guess I'll learn how to spin. Um, I do that with the jewelry as well. Um, it's kind of cool. That's kind of one of the reasons in, you know, in the broader conversation about craft, one of the reasons I think craft is so great is you can develop those skills. But I think, um, I definitely think it's both. Um, going back to your question, I think, yeah, yarn can be, but I think the process, I think there's just something about the process, especially in weaving, um, but even in the stitching and the embroidery, there's just something about the going up and the going down and the going, there's, there's, there's a comfort in, in the rhythm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a rhythm in almost all of it that is very sort of, um, um, that's kind of what inspires and really where I kind of get that sort of, what is it? The, uh, the flow energy. Mm. Um, and it seems like too, like I see, I feel like, and I don't know, maybe I'm making a generalization about um, needle crafters and textile people, but there seems to be that sort of de defiant streak going back to what you're saying about, um, you know, embroidery and stitching was sort of like a a outlet for for female um for, for women female yeah. crafters, but just for women to be um expressive of of things that were not being said out loud or being mm -hmm. you know, allowed to be written so i feel like there's this kind of like defiant streak that runs through these needle craft artists and and even sort of um you know your your personalization of uh, either you know commercial wear or 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 are using embroidery to sort of personalize just even things that you do make from you know talk a little yeah. bit about um yeah I mean I think that's kind of what's so beautiful and what what I think is great to see people reclaiming that sort of mm -hmm. Um, that sort of history. And I have to say, I was putting, I was thinking about, you know, maybe as I was thinking about this talk and, and how I think, um, you know, going back to what inspires me and what I think is amazing, I think um, weaving in particular, but even stitching, um, it, the history is, it, it, women, women, men, men in some cases too, but primarily women have been doing this for millennia, not mm -hmm. just, it's not a modern thing. And I think there's that connection to the past that sometimes, and I'm not somebody that generally likes to get, you know, I'm not, I haven't done any of the ancestry stuff, but I do still think that it's important to have that connection. And I think having that connection and that knowledge of, you know, in a lot of ways, it was what held them back. Um, I think I, um, I'm particularly inspired by Annie Albers, who was a Bauhaus weaver. Um, she did not choose to weave, and that kind of also was kind of a nod back. A lot of people who did this didn't have the choice, um, and yet they did it beautifully, and they made it, they, again, that defiant streak of speaking out about the choices they did or didn't have, um, but also making it their own, you know, adding, it, most embroidery techniques go back to various different cultures, um, you know, and there's different um, emblems and color combinations that can be linked to people groups around the world and what those colors and what those symbols meant um, to those people is kind of all came from women expressing themselves and being um, and designing. And I think 
that concept of having that history and being connected to that kind of grounds me um, and kind of keeps me from being a little too sort of, you know, high and mighty crafter type. Um, I hope at any rate. Um, the um, question about the technique that you use to make water's edge pieces. Um, can you talk, talk about how they were made and was it on a loom? How was it? Um, I think considered tapestry or yeah, they're tap, they're more tapestry techniques. Um, although I'm not a, I've done a little bit of traditional tapestry and have taught that, um, which is best using certain types of um, yarns. Um, a lot of the yarns that, um, so typically traditional tapestry, um, you don't really want to use knitting yarns for um, because they have too much, too much springiness to them. Um, you want something very stable. Um, I kind of, again, I hand spun those and, and I spun them from yarn fibers and stuff that um, to really get the color, the depth of color that I wanted, um, that I felt like I could then add those shells and those found objects to. Um, so I definitely used a small, one of them is on a hocket loom, and I think the other one I did um, just like a makeshift frame. Um, I buy those um, frames from Michaels for stretching and pop them together and wrap yarn around it and, you know, can you can weave. Um, and that's kind of, um, you know, another thing when I teach my embroidery classes, I try to show, you know, you don't need the fancy looms. Um, if you want to try weaving, just get a frame. Find a frame in your house that you don't have a picture in. Take the glass out, wrap some yarn around it, and uh, try weaving. Um, and so that's kind of where those came from. And that's actually something else I do have a, a lot of <laughs> small looms. Um, a sample loom from Pearl and Loop, a Hocket loom, um, and he's he's retired, so those are precious at this point in time. Um, and they're great. They have like, I, I really love the Hocket loom. Um, I have a peg loom from Harrisville that I love. Um, so depending on the size of the tapestry and the size of the piece, I, um, uh, it, it, I'll use any of those. Um, the big challenge for me has been finishing. So when I use those smaller looms, I, I do my best to try and figure out the least amount of manipulation when it comes off the loom. So um, that's probably why I have so many of those. Um, but sometimes I just knot the, the warp ends and stitch them down on the back, which is another way that the stitching comes into the weaving. Um, um, so I think it's really interesting because, you know, there's so much that you are invested in that's, that's really hand based, you know, it's, it's, it's tactile, it's kind of intimate because you're working, you know, independently with textiles. Mm -hmm. um, but there is this sort of disconnect because you do have that, that production, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a professional um, past and I'm, and, and you are very passionate about this idea of textile literacy. So can you kind of like talk just I know we're, we're almost running out of time, but briefly talk about kind of like those two things that seem really disconnected and how they are interwoven. Yeah, together. I, I think in terms of being a crafter, there aren't very many that have a foot in both, <laughs> both camps, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of gives me a unique perspective on both those situations. Um, I, worked, I worked on a small production floor um, down in Fall River. Um, and I worked, um, we primarily, um, at the time that I was there, were primarily making um, products, um, positioning aids for neonatal, um, for use in the neonatal units for preemies. Um, so there was a huge amount of um, responsibility there to make sure that the product was, you know, a quality product is important and the girl, the people that I worked with putting out a quality product was important to them as well. Um, and I saw that in a number of ways, 
but quality becomes something completely different when it's being used for somebody who's sick. Um, so, you know, while it may not be unsafe, if there's a stain in the fabric, it implies that it's not clean or it's not dirty. Um, and having this like extra cautious like approach to making something and making sure that what we had went out um, and that if parents saw their children using that in that that situation, um, that was important. And I think having that experience kind of informs my knowledge of production and manufacturing. Um, I do believe that there are some places out there, again, um, traditionally, stitchers were often paid by how quickly they could work. Um, and when that's the case, um, quality tends to go down. Um, and then you wind up with places like sweatshops and stuff like that, where if they're, things are turned out too quickly and the skills are not put to their best use. Um, and I think, I think, I think having an understanding of the, having worked with people in manufacturing, I value the people who are making, um, making our stuff. And I, I kind of sometimes struggle with the, um, I, I sort of struggle with the dichotomy of the issue. You know, I know a lot of people are out there trying to encourage people to buy more crafted stuff and buy things from people you know and buy, um, but does that help those people in those places who have these skills that I do think are valuable? They're just not being paid or treated as they should. Um, and that's kind of where that kind of informs my, my, um, my passion about textile literacy and the knowledge of the skills. And I think crafting kind of gives us that connection to the skill that these people have. Yes, it's put into, um, you know, in a, in a more uh, commercialized way. Um, yeah. But I think that crafting kind of connects you to these people that are making things. And that's kind of Absolutely. the way I see it and the thread that, that ties it together. You know, they, they, the people I worked with, I remember one time doing a sample for somebody and she just did not want to give it over because it was not the quality she wanted it to be. And I said, it's just a sample. We're not selling it. Nobody's promoting it. This is just a prototype. And I think that we need to consume and figure out, I think it's better. I think the importance is, is knowing who we're purchasing from and whether or not they value that in the people they're purchasing, the stuff we're purchasing from. And I think that that um, is going, I think as a public, we're going to be called to, to try and figure out how we can have more transparency from our vendors, you know, yeah. the big box stores. And that's kind of, I think we can do that when we have a better knowledge of the skills. Yeah, that's, it's a huge topic. And so I appreciate you being able to sort of, you know. I know, I kind of went <laughs> off a little bit there. And no, no, no. Exactly I think it's, I think it's really important. I think that what, that's what makes um, your work that much more meaningful and, and not just your personal work, but also your work as, as an um, educator more meaningful. And I think that's the thing that we try to focus on here at Fuller Craft as well is that, you know, craft is um, contemporary craft. So current makers really are, um, extending, um, you know, this thread. I'm going to keep using this this pun. They're extending this thread, you know, back to to the hand the handwork that um, everything came from, and then eventually became industrialized. And it's really getting us back in touch um, with these sort of um, small skills that are so important. Um, so to kind of close our conversation, if anyone else has some more questions about um, the upcoming class, the in-person class embroidery that is next weekend, um, or any of the skills that you talked about or any of the techniques that you talked about today, uh, this is the time to put it into our chat box. Um, I think that, yeah, like learning those skills can seem really intimidating at first, um, but that's the thing that we kind of really want to promote here at Floorcraft, and I think that you've um, demonstrated a lot of that today. Thank you. Can you... Uh, you want to add anything else onto that? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think I got a couple of the answers. Yeah, I think. Um, I don't 
don't, I can't think of anything else. I think I've kind of exhausted it all. Um, but no, I thank you for the questions and um, I thank you for this opportunity. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really great to have you join our craft chats. Um, yes. and it's really great to see that, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's something that we can all really get something out of, whether or not we're making, we're taking our own hand, um, you know, to thread a needle or if it's something, just being able to appreciate the work that goes into some of these textile pieces that we, we interact with on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, and I, that's, again, like, that's kind of what I go back to. I think that even just, you know, the basic using of a needle skill has kind of faded from our um, current um, base yeah. of skills, you know, and I, I recently, I saw an article and maybe I'll finish on this. It was a couple of years ago. There was a surgeon in the UK who was lamenting the fact that his students couldn't stitch um, a surgical, he was a surgical instructor, a surgical, yeah, he, he taught, you know, he was a teaching doctor. And, he, you know, the, these, these skills are more important than just what I've spoken about. Um, you know, they, they translate into other things. And I think that fine motor skill um, is something that we can regain um, at any age. And I think it's, it's, um, it's important to have it back. And again, it gives us that connection to, you know, what we're consuming, the clothes that we're wearing, the textiles in, in our bathroom, in our bed, on our beds, in our cars, they're everywhere. And when you start noticing that textiles are everywhere, they really are everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have sort of that perspective on, you know, uh, where it comes from, how it's created, and then you can mm -hmm. kind of appreciate those things more. And then it's kind of nice to have the skills. If you, if you do decide, to, if you, you know, it's not the skill isn't for everyone, you know, not everyone's going to yeah. want to embroider or weave. Um, but it's kind of nice to be able to um, acknowledge what work was put into. It. And then if you do decide that you want to become, you know, a, a needle crafter, you can kind of, you know, have the power to mend your own clothes, have the power to make your own clothes. Um, I have an aunt that raised her, all her children, she had three boys and two girls, to know how to sew, know how to change oil in a car and put gas in it, and know how to cook. And when her son went to the military, he had to hand him his own um, uniform. And he said, if I had been more mercenary, I could have made so much money off of it because the stuff, they would test it. They would reach up and grab it down. And his mother had taught him how to sew and hem appropriately. And I think, Again, that kind of taps into the law skill. Yeah, mend your own clothes. <laughs> but yeah. sorry, I jumped in there. But yeah, I think. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's great. It's valuable in so many ways. Yeah, there's a lot of value in it. That's awesome. So thank you so much for sharing all you shared with us today. We look forward to seeing you um, in the studio uh, teaching. And um, excited you about that. Yeah, so I'm excited. Um, to have you back in the studio. And Titi, do you want to wrap up um, anything else? Yeah, thank you, Gwendolyn, for coming today. It's great to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Sage, for moderating. And just want to thank folks who are coming out today. And, uh, we'll look forward to the next time you join us for another craft chat. Thanks so much, folks.